Hello guys and welcome to the Beyond Standards channel, my name is Shanks and today we are back with the Battle for Christmas tournament for BFME 2 The Rise of the Witch King in the Losers Round 1. This time between Lukat against Tyrol in the best of 3. Before losing any more time, let's get it started. Alright guys, at the bottom side of the map we have the orange model player Lukat. And Lukat's opponent at the top side of the map is the red model player Tyrol. This is a Mordor mirror we are on the map Sorowile. You will have two slaughterhouses coming up for Dyrel at the top side, and Lukat is also building up two slaughterhouses. Mordor mirrors are matches we have not seen quite a lot on this channel, and I'm assuming early on we're gonna see Orcs Fiesta fights all around the map. I would love to see that one. And indeed, after two slaughterhouses, Lukat is building up the first Orc pet. And the same situation also for uh, Dyrel, but he's actually building up the second Orc Pit immediately after the second Slaughterhouse. But Lukat is going for the Slaughterhouse number 3 and will be potentially also building up an Orc Pit right after. And that's gonna give um, Dyrel an advantage because he will have more units early on on the field. I mean, you know, in RTS games, also in Rise of the Witch King, time matters a lot. So, you know, if you are the first one who has more units on the field, you have the early advantage, you have the early pressure, and you can snowball with that lead. But on the other side, uh, Lukat is gonna have more economical starts, so he will have better resource income. And because he was building up the third slaughterhouse faster than Dyrell did, if he doesn't lose them, they're gonna hit level 2 faster as well, which means more command points and also more resource income. The second Orc is coming up for Lukat at the bottom side. And yeah, as expected, we're gonna see early on Orcs fighting all around the map, but later on we might also see some transition into something like Haradrim Lancers from the Haradrim Palace level 2. But what I would love to see in this matchup is definitely Gothmog, because Gothmog, as you guys know, does give leadership to the Orcs exclusively, so you can make your Orcs really strong with the War Chance, with the passive which is called Horde Bonus. When gathered in numbers of 100 or more, they're gonna deal passively 25% more damage. And keep also in mind that Orcs got buffed this patch 2.02 version 8.4. They do now deal 25% more damage as well. Power point wise, uh, let me take a look into that. Um, nothing was chosen just yet from both the players, so they are not choosing the Eye of Sauron, they are also not choosing the War Chant just yet. And going for the Eye of Sauron is gonna make your units weaker early on, because remember, Eye of Sauron is a leadership. And leaderships are weaker than the buff you get from the War Chant. And, but on the other side, if you start with the Eye of Sauron, you can actually skip the War Chant and try to aim to collect 10 power points afterwards. And that's gonna unlock your industry, which is a huge power spike for the Mordor faction. Nice sneaky attack here from Dyrell uh, from the bottom right side. He should be easily able to take down the slaughterhouse here, at the bottom right. On the other side, he has also some units around his own area for defensive purposes. And Lukat is, you know, looking for a chance to attack one of the slaughterhouses. But again, even though they got buffed 25%, they deal still not enough damage to burst down those slaughterhouses fast enough. So sending them out one by one should not work very nicely. And that's why I do like the attack from uh, Dyrell a, a little bit more because he was sending them always 2 by 2 I of Sauron is being used, I think this is from Dyrell. No, it's from Lukat, and from Dyrell at the same time. Okay, so Lukat is using his own Eye of Sauron offensively. The Builder was able to get away, and he will also be able to take down the Slaughterhouse here, with the help of the Eye of Sauron, and they're gonna hit almost level 3 after that. Look at this. Level 2.5. Why? Because with the Eye of Sauron, you also get... 50% more experience from killing anything, including the buildings. But if I take a look into the minimap, I see, you know, orcs all around the place, and look at that. I was actually luckily able to save this one. Or uh, orc archers are doing a great job, but he, if he doesn't pay attention, this one orc might be able to finish it off later on. Orc pits are, you know, alongside with the goblin caves from the goblin faction, the weakest barracks in the game. They have only 1500 health with level 1. So taking them down early on, unlike, you know, Hall of Warriors from the Dwarven faction, is pretty easy. Look at that. They are actually, you know, destroying that building within a second. Very well done. He has only one uh, Orc Pits left on the field, but he has a level 2 Haradrim Palace, and he's going for the Haradrim Lancers. Daryl on the other side has also a level 2 Haradrim Palace, 
and he was already getting the first lens of Italian on the field. And he should be also able to keep this one alive, which is really nice, because this one was, you know, as, was built up at the, um, as the third slaughterhouse. So it's gonna hit level 2 eventually, within the next 2 minutes. Alright, three, uh, 3 power points collected for um, Dyril, and 4.5 power points collected for Lukat. 450 command points are available for Lukat, 400 command points are available for Dyril. So Lukat is a little bit ahead in terms of power points, but also command points. But keep in mind, this can change within a second, because this slaughterhouse right there is very, very low. And trust me on that one, Tyrell is gonna try his best to finish it off. And also he has zero Easterlings around, and that's gonna be a fiesta once those um, lancers from uh, Tyrell are gonna make it to this side of the map. Alright, um, so the players, they both started with the Eye of Sauron, and now they have two, you know, two options. One of them is gonna be obviously to collect 10 power points and try to unlock the industry as soon as possible. But the other one would be to unlock the war chant from the spellbook for a potential double buff action. Nice move here, being able to destroy that one. We have a lot of orcs on the field from, um, from Lukat, but he's playing very defensively. And during all this time, Tyrell is pretty much untouched, which is really, really important. Because Dyrell is gonna be able to expand while being able to put pressure all the time. And for me, oh, that's a bad trample. No, never mind, those are actually from uh, Lukat. I take it back. And Dyrell has to be careful with his own lancers. Uh, he might be able to destroy this one in the backside. Let's see if this is gonna be the case. Yeah, he's actually being able to clump. Nice one. Eye of Sauron is being used for more damage. This way, they're gonna deal 33% more damage with the eye. And it looks like Lukat is indeed saving for the 10 power points in order to unlock the industry really fast. And Dyrell will be able to collect 5 power points pretty soon. And he might also try to save for the 10. But I think if you have a you know, momentum like he does right now, maybe it's gonna be better choice to go for the war chant because this is gonna make your units just much much stronger and you can actually win those fights even if you are getting outnumbered from your opponent. And the Builder has been taken down as well. That's very unlucky for Lukat. And the Slaughterhouse will be taken down right after. Uh, two Orc Pits, Haradrim Palace level 2. And we have only one Orc Pit up on the field. And that's the obvious reason why Lukat is not being able to push Tyrell back. And, you know, having a unit advantage in Rise of the Witch King or in any RTS game means a lot. As long as you don't throw your lead big time. With that, I mean, when you go for an attack and you lose literally everything without actually building up more units during the time, that's gonna give potentially Lukat a great counter-attack chance. And he might be able to deal devastating amount of damage to you. That's why it's so important to actually having multitasking abilities when you play RTS games. You need to attack, expand, and during all this time also keep making more units for the worst case scenario. Nice defense here from Lukat, he has a lot of archers on the fields, but they have zero protection, guys. That means if those lancers from uh, Dyrell can make it to those archers, they're gonna take down every single one of them. 7 power points collected now from Dyrell, and Lukat has collected 10 power points already, so he will be the first one who is unlocking the industry, which might be used on this slaughterhouse in the backside, and that's gonna be also the case. This one has a great protection with two buildings around that, and the fortress being in the backside, being able to shoot down the enemy units. And this is also, also level 2, which makes those buildings generally tankier. Look at that, a level 2 slaughterhouse has 2500 health, and a level 1 has only 2000 health. So this one has 25% more HP, which also makes it more tankier. Okay, but this one in the front side is almost down, and Dyrell keeps attacking all the time, constantly, and that's really important. And look at this... Uh, you know, army from Lukat. It is almost exclusively based on archers, and they will be able to deal decent amount of damage to the units, but they won't be able to destroy any buildings because archers, without a fighter upgrade purchased, are basically dealing zero damage to the buildings. Industry is being active. Oh, but he might lose this one actually. Oh, the east. Oh, that's a bad trample here from Lukat as well. He he will lose a lot of lancers and he lost the slaughterhouse with the industry on it. That's the worst case scenario, boys. And you don't want that to happen. 
Now, Luca is really, really behind. And he was even forced to build multiple expansions. They also cost 400 each, so that's 800 you know, resources invested into defense. And he's only sitting on 400 command points. Now, he's pretty behind. And Dyrel on, on the other side has 550 command points available. He has collected 6.5 power points after Warchant and I. He indeed went for the Warchant. That's going to delay his industry, yes. But it's absolutely fine. The reason why it's fine is simple because he was just able to kill the slaughterhouse with the industry buff on it from his opponent uh, Lukat. I wanted to say Lucas for some reason because the names are so complicated sometimes. We have also Corsars on the field, boys. I have Sauron is being available for the next fight. Corsars, by the way, are a great counter unit to the pikemen. That's also including the Easterlings from the Haradrim Palace from Lukat. And they are also kind of nice against buildings because with the firebombs you can keep your distance. With Easterlings around them, you can actually keep them alive. He has also Gothmog on the field. Gothmog has leadership with level 1, exclusively for the Orcs, Orc Archers and Black Orcs. So as you can see, those units are glowing, but the Corsars are not glowing. They don't have the leadership from Gothmog. Um, unless, unless he's going to use Eye of Sauron on them. But using Eye of Sauron on Orcs now wouldn't work, because as you guys know, leadership does not stack in Battle for Middle-earth 2, but also not in Rise of the Witch King. And Gothmog level 5 can actually be very important in this Mordor Mirror matchup. Why? Because Mordor, as we know, has a lot of tools for fear effects. Like, indeed, you have the Screech from the Nazgul, from the Felbeast, I mean, from the Witch King. You have the Roar ability from the Drama Troll. You have the Gatewatcher expansion. So you have a lot of tools of crowd controlling your opponent units. And when Gothmog is nearby and he's level 5 with the Iron Hand, he will give you immunity to fear and terror, which is... Very nice to have against Mordor. It's a back and forth all the time, but in my opinion from that what I've seen so far um, is Lukat having the control of this game in the past 5 minutes. Now what he needs to do is try to push your opponents back, but don't forget about map control. That is very very important and if not the most important thing in any RTS game, you don't need to rush and try to take down the fortress because this is not an easy thing to do. Since you have only orcs and they deal not enough damage to burst down a uh, fortress from any faction. That's why it's so important to keep killing those lot of houses left and right. And this way you can actually, you know, hurt the economy from your opponent big time. Deny him the command points he's looking for. Deny him the resource income he's looking for. And this way you can actually build up a huge advantage. And eventually force your opponent to surrender. The slaughterhouse is going to be taken down next, the one in the front side as well. And I like the grouping units of Tyrell big time. He has always a decent amount of group of units. This way he can make sure to burst down those buildings fast enough. Look at this, a lot of archers on the field. And those, um, you know, expansions around the fortress are being helpful as well. I of Sauron is being used, but look at that, boys. He has Haradrim archers coming on the field from the Haradrim Palace level 3 now. Industry is being used. And he's also building up some towers for defensive purposes. Lucan is going for a counter attack with a lot of lancers, but they are forced to retreat now. They won't be able to take down this one in the front side, because it's level 3. And level 3 means for any building, they will also be able to shoot now. And look at this. They are level 2 already, that's gonna unlock the barbed arrow shot. Radrum arches are elite arches from the Moro faction. They are way stronger than the orc arches you are able to get from the orc pits level 1. Which makes sense obviously because you need to upgrade your Haradrim Palace to level 3 first. And then you also need to invest 500 resources for these archers. While Orc archers they only cost 250 each. Right, that's a decent amount of damage dealt. Gothmog is also being around. He's almost level 5. He's using the Fury which is going to give him a boost of 200% increased damage. And after taking down the Orc Pit he's leveling up to level 5. Uh, look at this, get, getting more builders on the field, the Lancers are coming for defensive purposes, but they are actually dying very very fast. They get slowed down by the time they are trampling, that's why they were not able to trample down those uh, archers. Look at the barbed arrow shot guys, even dealing a lot of damage to the Lancers, and they won't make it out alive. And look at pretty much lost everything, he has zero command points under his control. He has nothing left on the field anymore, his resources are not looking great as well, and that should be the game number one, indeed. Lukat is surrendering, and the first game was won by Daryl, 
we're gonna jump right into the game number two. Alright guys, the game number two is all about to begin. This time we are on the map Eastfold and at the left side of the map we have the orange Isengard player Lukat. And his opening at the right side of the map is the red Man of the West player Dyrell. I like this matchups out a lot guys. I mean, I don't know how many times I've said that but it is just how it is. I like the good against evil matchups the most in all battle for Middle Earth games because this way we will get to see different types of units different types of heroes and abilities and that's why they are by far my most favorite matchups in the game and especially Man of the West against Isengard feels like a classico matchup. Isengard's player Lukas by the way was just using the vision of Palantir to scout uh, the faction of uh, Dyrell because we are hosting this tournament as an unrevealed random tournament which means and that if you pick random, your opponent won't get the chance to see your faction anymore in the loading screen. Which is always the case, by the way, in Rise of the Witch King. Normally, when you play Rise of the Witch King and you pick random, your opponent still gets the chance to see your faction in the loading screen. But for this tournament, we want to try out the unrevealed version of this game and see how it works. Two furnaces into the work pit starts, into the work packs. On the other side, I see two farms from Dyrell. And he's gonna go for an offensive barracks, yes indeed. And he's actually building up some spearmen first, which is a nice counter unit to the work packs coming from the work pits. And they're gonna be great in all situations, and the barracks is pretty tanky from the Man of the West faction, unlike from the Moro faction we have seen in the game number one. Remember, the orc pit with level one has only 1500 health, but the barracks from the Man of the West has 3000 HP, which means a double amount of health in our orc pit. And he's actually gonna go for offensive creep first at the bottom right side. With those Rohan Spearmen, it should not be a big deal to creep this works really fast and they're gonna hit level 2 after they are done. And the only downside of this start is it's a risky start after all. It's a snowballing start and you wanna deal maximum amount of damage and keep your opponent around this side of the map because your own side is unprotected. Maybe that's the reason why he was building those farms really close to the fortress, so they have some sort of protection. And if you lose the barracks around this side, you will be pretty much without any units. Grab the money, yes, he will be able to get the money as well from the creep, that's around 200 something gold. Which means you can actually get around one soldier for free. So he's gonna go for an attack, rallying call is available and remember, Isengard's player was picking the vision of Palantir, but that's fine, why? Because the work packs, they have the whole ability anyway, which is a replacement for the war chant. Oh, that's a nice damage dealt already, they will be forced to retreat and the furnace in the front side is gonna be definitely taken down. My, he needs to make a choice now, I think he needs to protect against those spearmen first. Otherwise he will be losing more than, on, more than only one furnace. And yeah, the furnace has to get demolished. And that's really nice, because the farms are still up on the field, the barracks is building up now, the barracks here is still around as well, so he can keep making units left and right, getting the spearmen on the field just in time for some protection. And as the work packs can't trample down the enemy units, going over the spearmen doesn't kill you as well. The work pit is level 1 only, but trying to take it down is gonna be almost impossible, because the work pit is very very tanky and the buff of the rallying call is, is gonna be almost gone now. And getting to the furnace in the backside is quite challenging because look at the build order here. He has Uruk Pits and Work Pits as a body block for the furnace. And if you go around that, the fortress is gonna shoot you. So it's really, really hard for the Man of the West player Dyrell now to take down this furnace here. But he's gonna try at least deal some damage. Remember, in Rise of the Witch King, you get power points from being able to damage the opponent units as well. But he's gonna lose quite a lot of units. Luckily, he was able to keep the farm, but also the barracks still up on the field. He has some protection and those work packs, they won't be able to fight against those spearmen because they are getting hard countered from this unit. And during all this time, Dyrell is also pretty much untouched. And indeed, look at these two farms, they are almost level 2 already. And he has, you know, two barracks, he's now going for the stable for the Gondonites slash Rohirrim. Uh, Rohirrim, they are pretty expensive units and you also need to invest 650 resources instead of 500 for the Gondonites. And in order to recruit Rohirrim, you also have to level up, you know, your stable first to level 2. Which is, you know, obviously gonna cost you some, some time and also some resources. 
But keep in mind that he was able to creep the work lane at the bottom right side. But all the other creeps on the map Eastfold are still remaining on the field. Luckily, Lucas was able to expand around the left side of the map, which is really nice. He has actually collected 400 command points already. But the man of the west player, because he was not losing any farms just yet, has 450 command points collected. Okay, the first Gondor Knight is gonna be joining the battlefield soon. Which can be really nice in this kind of situations. Why? Because right now the Isengard's player Lucard has zero pikemen on the field. And even though you might think that the warp packs are pretty strong, but trust me on that one, they can't match the Gondor Knights in a 1v1 situation. Because the men of the West faction are famous for the strong cavalry units in Rise of the Witch King. Um, this one might be protected. But again, you know, in those kind of situations, you need to always keep in mind that the work packs are not able to trample down the enemy unit, so they need to kill them in a melee fight. And that's not gonna be fast enough, that's why the furnace got destroyed. And Man of the West player is being able to collect more and more power points from being able to destroy those buildings, but on the other side, the Isengard's player is being able to collect those power points from, you know, killing the enemy units. And it looks like uh, the Gondor Knights are gonna attack from the bottom right side. That's a really offensive farm at the bottom right side, which is on the field now for a you know quite long time actually. That's why you know expanding offensively might be in some sit in in some you know certain situations a great solution, because that's not gonna be expected from your opponent that you will have a farm at the bottom right side at offensively, especially not as a man of the west faction. I mean, when you are playing goblins or dwarves, it is most likely gonna happen. Because that's how their kit works. But Man of the West doesn't have this tunnel system like dwarves or goblins. That's why building up an offensive farm like this might not be very expected from your opponent. Nice one here from those Gondor Knights being able to destroy one of the furnaces. That's gonna force the Isengard's player to make some pikemen. Otherwise, he won't be able to deal with those Gondor Knights in long terms. Isengard's player Lucard is also being able to creep the work layer now. With crossbow man, they have zero protection, guys. If the Gondor Knights can make it, Vision of Palantir got used, and that's something I need to talk about because that's gonna make those work packs faster. So running away from them might not be the perfect choice, but it looks like Dyril is gonna be actually able to save them for now. He needs to be careful. He's gonna lose the entire battalion. That's really unfortunate. And yes, a lot of work packs on the field. I mean, like I said before, yeah, I, you know, one in a one v one situation, the Gondor Knights are gonna win. But that was not a 1v1 situation at all. There are so many war packs on the field from Lucat, and I think that's gonna force, if nothing else, the Man of the West player to make multiple pikemen slash archers because the war packs are not very strong against archers either. And they are units, I would call them reliable early mid game, but they fall off really hard in the late game, just like the wolf packs from the Ingmar faction. I mean, you wanna make the transition later on into something like war riders from the war pits level 2. Nice one, being able to destroy another furnace and yet another furnace, which is really nice. And look at this, look at this guys, there is zero protection, does he have rallying call? He did have rallying call, but he's not gonna use it. Luckily he was clumped with the units, and clumping against Kev is always nice, why? Because with the trample you can, you can actually slow them down, and this way they won't be able to one-shot your entire battalion. And you see Kev, like Gondor Knights, and you don't have any pikemen, make sure to group with all of your units. This way you can actually get them slowed down while they are trying to trample you down. The Gondor Knights, they will be able to get away this time. They are only level 1, so they won't have to self regeneration. The man of the West player, Dyrol, has to make sure to make a well in order to be able to heal up with those units. And I think that's gonna be the first big fight in the middle of the map. Rallying Cole is available, Warchan is being used already. I like the way... You know, Daryl is playing that. He is not gonna force a fight with, you know, all out pretty much. He's gonna make sure to split some of his units, being able to attack in the middle of the map, yes. But at the same time, also trying to destroy some of the enemy buildings is really, really important. And one of the Gondor Knights was actually able to get away. I hope he is paying attention and he might be able to save them. Palantir is being used. Uh, Sharku is looking for a chance to get into the backline, and we know what happens if Sharku does that. Because Sharku loves those kind of situations, he loves to be against clumped units with his splash damage. 10 power points collected and arrow, arrow volley is gonna be chosen, which is... Hmm, I don't personally support this idea of going for the arrow volley against experienced players. By the way, Lucard is definitely 
an experienced player in Rise of the Witch King. Because Arrow Volley, in my opinion, can only work if you have something to stun. Like Boromir, for example, once you get him level 2, one of Gonzo, and then use Arrow Volley. I like this one. Arrow Volley is also a pretty long cooldown, so you wanna use it really smart. And with the combination of the Horn of Gondor, you can actually make it undodgeable because Horn of Gondor is gonna stun the enemy units and Arrow Wally is gonna 100% land on the enemy units. But you wanna get him level 2 first. And Arrow Wally, in compared to the long shot from the Rangers, for example, has a really strong effect because it's gonna put fire on the ground and that means units staying on this field are gonna take damage over time. But it was not very efficient, he was killing, what, some archers, but that's it. That's 10 power points invested to kill some units. In my opinion, it's not worth it. Maybe Lone Tower would be the better choice. Because he has even some rangers now up on the field. He could, you know, be putting them inside. And I think Isengard right now is not in a situation in which he can burst down this tower fast enough. Okay, we have a stable level 1. We have 2 barracks level 1 and 1 archer range level 2 for the rangers. 750 command points collected for the Man of the West player, Tyrell. On the other side, 575 command points collected for the Isengard's player, Lukat. He is sitting on almost 9 power points now after Palantir and the Warchant. With the 10, he might go for something like Wildman of Dunland summon, but I would recommend him to go for the Devastation, because Devastation is so nice for Isengard. That's gonna give you every, you know, couple of minutes a burst of money income, which you can invest to make more units or save for a hero. And as we can see already, he has, uh, you know, Lourdes and Sharko up on the field. The next hero he should be aiming to get is definitely Saruman. Saruman is a really, really strong hero and we have seen this, you know, quite a lot of times that wizards in Battle for Middle-earth games are able to change the outcome of the game. Boromir is level 2 and Horn of Gondor is so nice to have. But the rangers are getting killed really, really fast. And losing them is gonna hurt you big time, because they are very expensive units. Industry is gonna be chosen actually, okay? Industry can also make sense, uh, but the difference between Industry and Devastation is Devastation can't get countered, guys. Like for Industry, you need to keep this furnace alive and it's gonna give you money over time. Maybe it's gonna be more effective in long terms, but Devastation on the other side is gonna give you immediately, instantly money and that's, you know, situationally better in my opinion. By the way, also the Vestation from the Isengard spellbook can deal quite a lot of damage to the ends from the Elven faction. Okay, we're gonna definitely have a fight around this side. Rangers, they need some protection and they are, you know, stronger than the crossbowmen in a 1v1, especially in those kind of fights. And if you get them level 2, the long shots can actually at least force your opponent to, you know, to reposition themselves, so he needs to make sure to dodge the incoming damage and that's gonna force him to move. When he's moving, he's not gonna be able to deal damage to you, so it can be nice. And the combination of Boromir level 2, Horn of Gonzo, and the long shot is always nice to have against Isengard. Why against Isengard? Because Isengard doesn't have any fear resistant until he gets Saruman on the field and gets him level 5. Until this moment, he won't have any counter abilities to Horn of Gonzo, and he will be always stunned. Boromir is gonna be very, very, you know, impactful. He's very low though, and Horn of Gondor is almost gonna be back up. He has long shot available, and we might see a Wombo combo potential around this side now. Boromir is now back almost to full health, and uh, because he was using the heal ability from the spellbook. 950 command points are available, by the way, guys. That's quite a lot. Oh, that's a bad trample to take. Boromir and the Rangers were able to get away, but Sharku has to be careful. He's almost level 5 though, and level 8, level 7, sorry, with the Man Eater is gonna make him really strong and almost unkillable. We have now the brother coming from the Boromir. Baromir is his name. Um, the captains of Gonzo are both now on the field. Uh, Boromir needs some support against Lourdes, because we all know what happened in the movies. We don't need, we don't you know want that to happen also in the, in the games. Boromir has leadership, Faramir has leadership, Boromir unlocks that with level 5. And Faramir unlocks it with level 6. The Boromir still needs around 2 levels to unlock that. And by the way, leadership obviously can get negated from uh, the Man of the West faction by Isengard with the Kribane. However, he didn't go for the Kribane so far. But I think if he goes for... Uh, if he unlocks the leadership, Isengard should be going for the Kribane just to be... Just to make sure that enemy units don't have leadership, because rangers are the strong already, and with double buff, with that I mean Boromir leadership and the rallying call, 
they can hit like an absolute truck. That's why you want to make sure to unlock the Cremain from your spellbook. Just to negate the leadership and on top of that also make the enemy units weaker. Okay, Warc Riders with Sharku are doing a great job. Okay, nice one. He was able to catch them with the Horn of Kondo. Oh, might be able to get away still. Oh, that was close, but not close enough. And the Warc Riders are getting taken down. We have Eomir on the field. Eomir is something like um, Sharku from the Isengard faction. Um, I would say Eomir is one of the most cost-efficient heroes in the game. He, you know, gives you a lot for the low price. He can actually give leadership with level 1, just like Sharku can. But Sharku actually has to get level 3 first. Sharku does give only leadership to the to the work packs and work... Oh, okay. Rest in peace, Eomir. He was running it down and Lourdes was able to get experience from that skill. Lourdes has also level 5 leadership. And unlike Isengard's Man of the West does not have any effects of... You know, nullifying the enemy leadership, guys. So Lourdes leadership is going to be permanently active. The builder has to be careful, has to run for his life. The tower in the middle of the map is going to get burst. It's going to get bursted down. Really nice surrounding here from the Isengard's player Lukat. And the farm is going to be taken down next. And the power points are rising. And look at the money from Isengard's player Lukat. He's definitely going for the white wizard. But I think he's low on command points. <clears throat> and his command points capped. That's why he's not being able to recruit him just yet. Now he has enough command points to get him on the field and the white wizard should follow up very very soon and I would love to see that. Urukpit's level 2, Bernie's level 3 with the industry on it. And it looks like he's not going for Saruman, he's actually gonna go for siege weapons here. No armory, armory is coming up, I take it back. And siege weapons at the same time, so he was able to afford that, he had a lot of money. We have some trebuchets now following up from the siege works. Workshop it's called. I think, no, it's called Siege Works actually. It's called Workshop in Battle for Middle Earth 1, by the way. But they don't have the Firestone up upgrade purchase just yet. And with that, they won't deal enough damage. I mean, they are always nice to have. But they won't be able to burst down those buildings fast enough. With the Firestone upgrade on these trebuchets, they get a massive damage boost. And they will hit, they will hit like an absolute try. Trust me on that one, guys. Tower is coming up here for, def for defense. And the Warchant is being used, and the units are dying very fast. Like, ooh, the arrow volley, boys! That was a crazy arrow volley, but during all this time, the Warc Riders with Sharku are trying to deal some damage in return. However, they are forced to retreat. Arrow volley was just messing up, and the combination, the bombo combo potential you have with the Sporomir and the long shot of Rangers or the arrow volley from the spellbook is actually insane. The siege has begun. But this one trebuchet is going to need ages to kill this fortress. And during all this time, he's also being able to kill some furnaces left and right. But at the same time, also Isengard's player is able to punish the Man of the West player for not having any kind of defensive units around his own side of the map. And a lot of farms will be taken down. What under oh, the Watcher was coming in clutch and I missed that one. That's my bad, guys. Sorry. However, uh, Boromir and some rangers were able to survive as well as Faramir, but Faramir is very, very low. At the same time, we have also the Rohan Elias summon from the spellbook of the Man of the West player. Look how much damage now he will be able to deal. He's not going to be able to surround the, surround the fortress because this fortress has some, you know, a lot of protection. Look how many ballistas he has around the fortress and how many towers. But the work pits level 2 might be taken down. However, um... Yeah, what I want to say is I would expect some more damage from this Rohan Elias from the Man of the West player. So instead of trying to take a production building, I would say try to take down some more resource buildings. But yeah, in order to take down the level 3 furnace, he had to destroy one of these buildings because it was buddy blocked big time from all around the place. One of Gondor is being used once again, but there is no follow up. Only one range of battalion, half a battalion actually. But size doesn't matter everything, guys. They are still killing a lot of units and they are leveling up quite fast at the same time. Eomir is back on the field, chasing down some of these uh, work riders from Lukat. The Furnace level 3 is gonna also get destroyed, potentially. They don't have too much time left anymore. I think they can still make it. However, the Ballistas are knocking them down constantly. Here will be used and the Furnace has been taken down. And look at that, guys. Isengard's now is dropping down to 350 command points. Yes, still Sharko on the field, 
Uh, Sharku is level 7, has unlocked every single ability, including the Man Eater, which is gonna make him almost unkillable. And only uh, Pikeman will be able to kill them. We have some Ballistas now coming from the Siege Works level 2. Boromir is gonna make it out alive. And Eomir is getting dismounted as well. So Eomir has a really strong ability which is called Outlaw Leadership. And this is pretty strong, guys. You will get money from each kill on the enemy units or buildings constantly. And unlike the leadership that does not only work on Cav, on Gondor Knights slash Rohirrim, it works on every single unit. So if Eomir gets level 4 and leveling, up, leveling him up to level 4 is actually pretty nice and easy, you can get a lot of money constantly from winning those fights or killing enemy units or buildings. Isengard's player is fighting until the end, but he's pretty behind. Man of the West player is sitting on 725 command points. He has a really strong area around this side. Look at this, double barracks. One of them is level 2 for the tower guards. Tower guards are really, really strong units. And they're gonna keep this Sharko away from the archers. Because if the Sharko makes a mistake as trampling down those tower guards, you will be surprised when he dies in a second. I mean, yeah, you can use the Man Eater ability and, and get 100% increased armor, which is pretty impressive. But the Ballistas are doing a great job defending. And I think um, Dyrell will need the Firestone upgrade from the level 2 to make those uh, trebuchets way stronger. So it's a Siege Works yes and now. I mean, the fortress has great protection and the army of the Man of the West play is not gonna make it to the fortress alive, at least. Um, and the Ballistas are doing a great job defending from Luka, so it's gonna take a while. That's why, you know, like I said in the game number one, it's so important to keep the focus on the map control, guys. At this point, you can see Dyrell wanna close the game, he wanna finish the game, he wanna win. But... Going for the fortress instantly might not be the best way to do so. Instead of taking down the furnaces first. Look at this. He has so many furnaces around the top side. He's getting a lot of resources from this side. He has alone around this area five furnaces. That's a lot. So make some Gondor Knights from the stable. Or Rohirrim now because the stable is level 2. And try... Oh, the level 3 farm got finally spotted. <laughs> the farm is here on the field now since the beginning of the game. It's unbelievable. And look how strong the farm is. He was able to kill the entire battalion of the Work Riders as well. Another Siege Works is coming up for the Man of the West player, Dyrell. And yeah, that's what I mean. Like, expand, fight for the map control, try to reduce the resource income from the Isengard's player. Okay, Lourdes got crippled down from Lourdes. Uh, I mean, Lourdes was able to cripple down Faramir. Heal is available so he can use it in the worst case. Oh, the builder got sniped down. One of the builders is dead. The second one is pretty low. Heal is being used now. Horn of Gondor is available, but there is nothing to stun. You can't stun, you can't stun the siege weapons. You can't stun the heroes. You have even some Galadrim warriors coming from the inn at the, at the bottom right side. Charco is lurking around, making sure to kill some farms left and right. And we gotta give credits to Lucas in this situation because he keeps fighting for the map control. And he doesn't give up. Okay, for the next big fight... Uh, Arrow Volley is gonna be available again, but again, Isengard doesn't have many units, and indeed he has only units that can't get stunned from the Horn, you know, Horn of Gondor anymore. He has only Baristas and Heroes. He's finally getting some units on the fields now from the double barracks. One of the barracks is level 2. Uh, Uruk Pits, I mean, he can get some Berserkers on the field as well if he wants to. But that's gonna be now a challenge for the Man of the West player to win this game. Without the Firestone upgrade from the Siege Works level 2. He needs that one, trust me guys. That's gonna be a huge dam dam uh, damage boost. I can't even talk today, sorry for that. And what uh, Dyrell can also do is build up a marketplace. And get the Grand Harvest unlocked from the marketplace. That's gonna give you more resources from the farms. And in long terms, especially with this much command points collected. It's gonna be really rewarding and you should never be able to run out of money. With that, you know, you can always get more and more resources all the time. And by the way, guys, as the game gets slowed down a little bit, I want to ask you if you like this content. And if yes, please don't forget to leave a like on these videos. Likes, they help out for the YouTube algorithm big time. And if you didn't do it yet, make sure to subscribe to the channel as well. Um, this channel, as you guys know, is almost exclusively based on Battle for Middle Earth games. We are hosting events, tournaments with cash prize, without cash prize. 
trying to keep the esports feeling from the Battle for Middle Earth games as high as possible. I'm actually curious. He actually get damaged big time from the fight on the on the ground. That's crazy. Look at this guys. They almost got one shotted. He was almost able to kill three ballistas at the same time. Okay, Boromir got crippled down. He's level four. Captain of Gonzo is unlocked, which can give leadership. I mean experience. Sorry. Boromir against Lords, just like in the movies. And once again, Boromir, heal is not available, can't make it out alive. Lourdes is getting level 5. That's gonna unlock the leadership. And Vision of Palantir is gonna make him faster. The reason why he was getting slowed down like this is because of Boromir's brother Faramir. Because the Wounding Arrow in Rise of the Witch King is slowing down the enemy units or heroes. So it's a great chase potential. When you use it on one of the heroes from your opponent, you can slow him down and run him down as well. Luckily, the Man of the West player was finally able to kill some of these furnaces around the top side. And Eomia is level 4 already as well. Okay, so he's expanding, you know, getting more command points unlocked. But he's always low on resources because he keeps losing units. He has to, re you know, replace those units 24-7 as well. And for the next big fights, Rohan Elias might be ready. And the Watcher is gonna be ready as well as the Wildman of Thunland Summon. So I think Isengard, even though he has not many units on the field, has great situation for himself. And I think he might be able to defend himself with these two summons. Especially the Watcher, as we know, is a one-hit potential on all the units from the Man of the West player. And then you can follow up with the Wildman of Thunland. Just to make sure to kill the towers, to kill the buildings. I mean, the ballistas are doing a great job anyway. And it's a siege weapon war at this time of the game. And I'm still surprised that the Man of the West player does not go for the Firestone upgrade on these trebuchets. Because with that, you can actually take down those buildings, including the fortress, way faster. And not only that, but you will also increase your damage output against the enemy units or even heroes significantly. We have also the White Wizard finally joining the battlefield. White Man of Dunlin is being used for defensive purposes to kill those rangers, which is really nice. Ballistas are making out alive. Uh, Eomi has to be very careful. Lourdes has cripple ability available. He can use it on Eomi if he wants to. But I think he wanted to use it on Faramir. However, he won't get the chance to do that. The Ballistas are able to survive. We have a level 2 armory as well. But at the same time, the Man of the West player, Tyrol is being able to kill some furnaces left and right. And that's really nice. It's really nice. However, for the next big fight, the Watcher is going to be available for the Isengard's player Lucad, And that can actually, you know, turn the fight in your favor. The Watcher is coming in and I don't like this Watcher at all. It's only being used for like one battalion of Rangers. That's not worth it. Rohan Elias is gonna be available now for the Man of the West player and he collected 23 power points after that one, boys. This is crazy. So he's so much ahead. Uh, because Isengard has went for the devastation, so he's, you know, 25 power points away from getting his own big summon. Um, which can be something like the Summon Dragon, for example. And the Man of the West player can go for the Earthquake ability. And make sure to kill every building around that. And ideally you want to... Oh, he was actually using the Rohan allies already to kill the Ballistas. I see you. The Ballistas are actually quite tanky. He needs some time to ta be taken down. Tarmon is only level 1, so he can't use... You know, he can't be effective in ranged fights. Don't run into the Pikeman. He's gonna try to deal some damage and try to get the power points unlocked he needs. The friendly fire is also being able to kill some of the pikemen because the ballistas, when they shoot and your own units are getting hit by the ballista shots, they're gonna also get damaged and might die in a second if multiple ballista shots are gonna hit you. He's just trying to get the power points unlocked at this point. He might be able to get them unlocked after killing this furnace, but he should not. I mean, really important to mention is the fact that Isengard's player is not getting any power points. That was a nice wizard blast, by the way. Not any power points unlocked from killing this unit. Earthquake is now available, but he has no vision anymore. So using it right there doesn't make any sense. Ideally, you want to use it around this side. So you want to make sure that you include the fortress and then hit those buildings around it. 
because Earthquake, Earthquake won't be able to kill the fortress, but it will one-shot the expansions around the fortress. That's why I was saying before, it's ideally you want to use it before you use the uh, Rohan allies, because you can use it, kill the expansions around the fortress, then use the Rohan allies. This way you can surround the fortress and try to take it down. And if you have Eomir around, Eomir, you will also give leadership to this Rohan allies as well. And this way they can deal more damage and you can even buff them with the rallying call and make them really strong. Okay, so Earthquake is available for the Man of the West player Dyril. He has full command points collected. On the other side, we have 550 command points available for the Isengard's player Lukat. He is sitting on two power points, but on the other side, he was unlocking Devastation Industry. So that's a lot of resource income from these two abilities from the spellbook. We have also finally Grand Harvest unlocked from the Man of the West player. Faramir is back on the field as well. He's almost level 6. That's gonna unlock the leadership. Eomir is level 5 now. And Sharku is level almost 9. I was not seeing him using the Mana Eater just yet, but to be honest, he didn't need to, because he was never in a dangerous situation. Remember, the Mana Eater does not only give you more damage and armor, but also it heals you from like 1 HP to full HP. Uh, that's why we will see that only being used when Sharku is being in a, in a rough situation in which he is almost dead, and he can use it and actually heal up to full health again. Okay, Earthquake is being used, and look at the damage, boys. He's being able to one-shot the Siege Works level 2, one-shot the Uruk Pits level 2 as well, and almost one-shot, no, actually not one-shot, it's not that much damage dealt to the Armory level 3. But all the expansions are gunners, guys. All the expansions are gunners. However, I don't like the fact that he has zero protection on these Ballistas. They are still being able to deal massive amount of damage. Oh yeah, nice wizard plus from the white wizard of Isengard. Saruman is popping off this game as well. Fireball, and that's gonna make it really tilting for the man of the best player. Because now this wizard is gonna be a one-man army, and it's not gonna become any better for the man of the best player. No, it's gonna become worse. Why? Because that's not even his final form yet, guys. Once he gets level 6 with the Thunderbolt, he can have three abilities that can wipe out your entire army and two of them are being used from a safe distance as well. And once he's level 5, that's gonna make your Boromir and his Horn of Gondor absolutely useless as well. Why? Because even though it's not saying, but trust me guys, Saruman, once he gets level 5, he has a passive hidden ability that's called Fear Resistant, just like Gandalf does. Gandalf level 5 also grants your units Fear Resistant. That means Horn of Gonzo, or Cloud Freak, or any kind of disabling abilities from any kind of heroes or spells can't work on the Isengard units as long as Saruman is nearby and he's level 5 or higher. Okay, Man of the West player is forced to disengage. Uh, I think the reason why it didn't work like he wanted to make, you know, make it to work is because he was you know, engaging with the Tower Guards. You should be using the tower guards as like a defensive unit to keep the to keep the trebuchets alive. And then, you know, keep the rangers alongside with them as well. Because the rangers were unprotected, so Sharko could just easily kill them. And same goes for the, for the trebuchets. They were pretty much unprotected all the time. And they, are, they don't have any defense, so when you get to them, you can kill them really fast. He was also finally able to purchase the Firestone upgrades, which I like to see a lot. Fireball once again, and Saruman is shining bright like a diamond once again as well. I'm always getting excited when I see these old wizards, because we, we rarely see them. I mean, to be fair, I think we do see Saruman much more often than Gandalf. That's my, you know, the reason might also be that Gandalf is more expensive than Saruman, but for me, Gandalf is overpriced, that's my personal opinion, and... He costs a lot of command points and resources, and as Man of the West faction, you don't have any tools of boosting your resource income that much like Isengard does. Yeah, you can technically go for the for the Grand Harvest. That's gonna give you 15% more, uh, you know, resources from those farms. But Isengard has Industry. That's gonna give him 200% increased resources from one furnace. He has Devastation. He has Wipeman of Dunland, and the, and they are Pillage passive. Yes, you know a lot of tools of getting this insta money for a cheaper hero 
That's why we are able to see Saruman much more often than the Gandalf. Okay, he has also, you know, I like the I like the upgraded units from Battle for Middle Earth so much. They look so nice, guys. Look at this heavy armor plus forged blades. They look so much so much stronger now. I mean, the Man of the West player has quite a lot of units. We have Wildman of Dunland being used offensively this time. But, you know, Palantir is being used next. Watch is gonna be ready soon as well. And it's a nice move. Ooh, the fire. No, the fireball. I mean, it's the Saruman, though. He's level 5, boys. Fireball next. Plus 6, plus 7 all the time. I think Lourdes is now level 8. That's why, yes, Lourdes has pillage ability unlocked. And that means, even though, look at the command points from Isengard. He's not that rich in terms of furnaces, but he keeps getting money now left and right from killing stuff. And look, his money is rising to the sky. I think Faramir might be... In trouble, never mind, Lourdes is gonna be forced to retreat, same goes to Saruman, so Man of the West player will be able to defend himself for now. But Isengard player's main goal was to deal some damage, kill as many units as possible and survive with the, mo with the two main heroes, in this case Lourdes and Saruman. And you can see, this game is a perfect example that can show you how impactful those heroes are in the late game. They are, you know, you need to invest time and money, obviously, to get them on the field and then also invest time to level them up to keep them alive. But heroes, especially heroes like Saruman or Lords, they are so impactful in any stage of the game. And once you are in the late game with Saruman, once you have all the abilities unlocked or at least until Thunderbolt, you will be very happy to have him on your side, fighting for your battle. You know what I'm saying? Like, they are so nice to have. In those big fights once they have some levels on them i mean now you have a army killing machine you have a hero killing machine with the cripple ability so you have leadership you have pillage which means for every kill you get some money and at this point of the game you will kill a lot of important units like gondonites you know heroes rangers those kind of units they're gonna give you much more money from the pillage ability nice and being able to maintain his resource income even though he is low on command points. And Man of the West player is struggling big time to finish off the Isengard player. Ooh, the Watcher is coming in clutch once again and saving the day. That's gotta be you know, frustrating for the Man of the West player Daryl at this point. And you can see that because he makes mistakes all the time and for the next attack he will have even the Thunder uh, Lightning Strike. From the fortress which is a wanted potential on the units at the same time as thunderbolt so at this point of the game i think isengard's player will be able to easily defend multiple attacks that's why that oh the sharku though sharku is making a mistake in running into the tower guards and dying those kind of mistakes they can easily turn the game around but from in my opinion the only way the man of the west player can win this is making or attacking more coordinated like attack him with a with a plan in your mind like you want to make sure that you have some trebuchets protect them with some power guards in front of them and in order to keep the heroes alive you will also need some rangers in the background to deal the damage to the saruman fast enough oh the arrow volley the, oh, the thunderbolt absolute fiesta the Thunderbolt was one-shotting literally everything and the Fireball is gonna follow up next and that's what I mean guys, that's what I mean. These heroes of Middle-earth, they are shining bright like a diamond in every single game and look at this, he's one me wanting Eomir. Eomir is on horse so he will be able to get away. The Fear Resistant is coming in clutch. Arrow Volley was still able to hit them. Boromir might be able to get away potentially. He's running for his life, he's trying to run for his life, he's gonna even use heal for that. And Isengard's player, instead of going for the 25, which can be the summoned dragon, he's actually going for the field of fires, because he wanna have the resource income he needs, in order to keep making more units and upgrades them at the same time. Because remember, he has three orc pits up on the field, boys. So he will need a lot of money. Oh, can he actually survive? It looks like he can. That was close, but not close enough, and Boromir, this time, will be able to make it out alive. He doesn't even have a well yet, so the regeneration is gonna take a lot of time. Saruman is still chasing- Oh, he had actually fireball ability available. I think fireball should be easily able to finish him, finish him off, but maybe he was not paying attention. Okay, Sharku is back on the field, I think. Yeah, there he comes. He's level 10, by the way, guys. 
Field of Fire is gonna give you 70% more resources from the slumber mills, that's why they are glowing like this. The furnace is glowing because of the industry. Almost every single building from the Isengard's player, look at it, is shining bright like a diamond. What is happening? And his units at the same time as well, his units are also shining bright like a diamond with the Forge Blades perches on them. And this game, holy guacamole, guys. Unbelievable, but it is how it is. Man of the West player was having a huge advantage, had a great momentum in his favor, but he was just not able to finish off the game. And now Isengard's player, after such a long time, being able to go for a counter-attack and now being able to kill multiple level 3 farms. is gonna put the Man of the West player, after a long time, below 1000 command points. And yeah, I mean, Earthquake is gonna be available soon again. With soon, I mean, it's gonna still take around 2 minutes, I'm assuming. Rohan Allies is available, Tom Bombadil is available. Tom Bombadil is a great counter unit to the heroes as well. Why? Because with Tom Bombadil you can keep knocking them down. He won't be able to kill a hero all alone, but he can knock them down. So if you have any follow-up, like Rangers or any other heroes, you can make sure to disable the enemy hero you want to kill with Tom Bombadil constantly. And then you can actually follow up with some other units in order to burst down. Because the main prior right now from Dyrell should be to kill Lourdes and Saruman. Especially Saruman has to get killed. Because as long as Saruman is on the field, it's gonna be almost impossible for a man of the West player to win those fights. You see what I mean, guys? Tom Bombadil is being able to knock him down. And, you know, you buy some time. Look again. Like, when this is happening, you have some time to kill him. But you need to kill him fast. And he has not enough units to burst him down fast enough. Even though Tom Bombadil is doing a great job all the time. Knocking him down 24-7. He was using the Vision of Palantir. Vision of Palantir is giving movement speed bonus to every unit. Including... Oh, he has the Knights of Dolam Roth on the field as well. Those are the elite units from the Man of the West faction. But I think they won't be very efficient at this point because they need to deal with the pikeman units from Isengard with forge blades and heavy armor. So they are really strong now and obviously pikemen are the greatest counter units to the enemy horses. Um, mini heroes, they have leadership in their kit. So they also give leadership to the Gondor Knights and Rohirrim. Uh, once they are level 5, the Charge of Glory is some smaller version of the Glorious Charge from Theodine when he's level 6. But I think the main thing about this ability is that no force can slow this charge, so you can use it and trample down the enemy units without being without being without getting slowed down, which is the main thing about trampling. Just like remember what happened in the uh, Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King, when Rohan arrived in Minas Tirith. And those Rohirrim with Theodin and Elmi and, you know, Mary and Eowyn were writing it down. They couldn't get slowed down. Why? Because Glorious Charge was being used from Theodin. Lourdes is level 9, healing up over time. Oh, that's the thing, by the way. That's the Thunder or Lightning Strike, it's called. The ultimate ability from the Fortress of Isengard. Oh, Sharku! Can't make it out alive. 168 money was getting, uh, you know, he was getting 168 from killing Shark. Why? Because Eomir was close by. And he has also pillage, just like Lourdes does. He has to disengage though. This fight is looking great for the Isengard's player. And those Urukai with the Forge players, look at the damage they are able to deal, guys. What can you do against such a reckless hate? And Boromir can't do anything about it, that's why he's gonna die. And the game is turning around in the favor of Isengard because now he has to summon Dragon. There he comes and that's the best ability you want to use against enemy buildings. You want to see why? Look and watch guys. Look and watch. Do you see that damage he's able to deal to three buildings at the same time? Every single attack of this dragon is something like a breath fire from Balrog. Every single attack. I mean, Balrog, oh, that's a nice arrow volley, by the way, guys. That's a really nice arrow volley. I mean, I take it back. Actually, Dyril was making a, a great work with those arrow volleys. But look at the army coming. That's crazy. What's happening? 
Earthquake is available, Rohan and Ice is available, but what can you do against such a reckless hate? Everything is falling apart. The stable is going down. The dragon is, you know, putting in some nice work. Rohan Ally is being used offensively with Eomir being around for the leadership. Earthquake is being used offensively as well. The fortress now unprotected. The lightning strike is not available. But Man of the West player is dropping down to 450 command points and his resources are not, are not looking great at all. And the Warc Riders are shining bright like a diamond. We have even the Worm Tongue on the field. Lourdes is gonna use the sword. The Fortress of Isengard is gonna potentially be taken down. Heal is being used, yeah, with the Rohan allies. <clears throat> you know, surrounding the fortress like this. Using Earthquake before to burst down the fortress to 70% HP. Kill all the expansions around it. And he was able to destroy the fortress. Now Isengard can't use of, uh, you know, but the Man of the West player also lost the fortress. And unlike Isengard, he is not in a great situation because Isengard has enough money to build like two, two times the fortress if he wants to. He has full command points against 150 command points only from the Man of the West player, Dyrell. And that's gonna bring us to the game number three, boys. The score after the game number two is gonna be 1-1. What a, what a nice game. I think Dyrell had this game in his, in his pocket, but he was just not patient enough. He was just not focused enough. And he was struggling to play against the Ballistas of Lukat. Lukat's well deserved the victory and we're gonna jump right into the tiebreaker game which is gonna decide who's gonna continue in the battle for Christmas tournament and who's gonna be out. GG well played. Alright guys, the game number 3, the deciding game is all about to begin. The score is 1-1 after a fantastic game number 2 on the map Eastwold. Now we're gonna be on the beautiful, beautiful map Ethan Mars Edit. And the matchup is gonna be Isengard from the uh, from Lukat, the winner of the previous game, against the uh, Isengard from Dyrell. So the first game was a Mordor Mirror, the second game was Man of the West against Isengard. Now the third game is Isengard Mirror. Ethan Wars Edit is one of the maps, one of the nine maps we have in the map pool. And in this tournament, you know, and in all the other tournaments we were hosting in the last year, uh, every map can only be played once in a series. This way we want to actually keep it more entertaining for you guys. Because I think, you know, seeing the same map over and over again, like in a best of nine, imagine seeing nine times the same map. You know, at least it sounds boring to me. And I want you guys to have fun watching those videos on YouTube. And if you have fun watching those videos, please don't forget to leave a like. Because likes, they do help out a lot for the YouTube algorithm, guys. Thank you so much in advance. Two furnaces Uruk put into the third furnace coming up from the orange Isengard play Lukat. On the other side, we have two furnaces into the Uruk pit from Dyrell into the third furnace in the backside. So no clan setting this time, no work pit, straightforward for the Urukai, for the reliable units of Isengard. The most expensive units, most expensive swordsmen in the game, alongside with Black Numenorians and the half twelve swordsmen from the Goblin faction. They all cost 400 each and Urukai, they have the advantage that you can recruit them from a level 1 building. Like you don't have to get your, you know, all of the Kingsmen to level 2. Or you don't have to build a fissure, you know. You can. This is like a like a barracks, which includes all the units you will ever need in an entire game. You have swordsmen, archers, pikemen, and then you have some poke units like berserkers, and then you have the deathbringers. That's why I would say, technically and theoretically, Urukai are a little bit cheaper than the Haftral swordsmen and the Black Numenorians, just because this is the building you will work all game long. Okay, we will have the clan setting coming up next. Clan setting got uh, buffed this patch. With buffed, I mean, you don't deal more damage with the Wildman of Sunlands, but the uh, cost got reduced. So, you know, I think it only costs now around 600 something. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that they reduced the cost of the clan setting, which is, uh, you know, not a direct buff to the Wildman of Sunlands, but, you know, kind of makes them more reliable now. Okay, that's a nice move here from Dyrell. If he gets away with the, with the Urukai. It should be nice, because he was baiting off the Warchant pretty nicely. He's gonna get some damage here, but that's fine. Just dancing around the Rosie, you can go around that and try to wait until the Warchant is gone. 
Because with the war chant being gone, those units are gonna lose a lot of damage. And this way you can use the war chant right after. You will become more tanky and you can actually make you know make it happen that you kill more furnaces during all this time. Okay, during all this time, Lukat is going for the creep. The pikeman. He was able to kill the troll already. And that's gonna, you know, make those units level two. He's gonna get a lot of money from the troll layer. Because unlike the work layer, the troll layer is actually leaving three parts of a treasure on the ground. Nice defense here, by the way, from Lukat. You will see what I mean. He's gonna get level two after that. And he has four parts of treasure on the ground, right? Yeah, he was getting two, four. That's around 400 gold you get. From creeping the troll layer, which is super easy to do by the way in Rise of the Witch King, all you need to do is one pikeman. And sometimes you can see that the, play uh, that the players are, you know, using one of the builders to lure the troll away from the lair. And then using the pikeman right after to burst them down without losing any HP. But strong pikeman like Uruk pikeman, they can easily do that by themselves. Okay, um, Wildman of Dunland are a great counter unit to the pikeman as well. Uh, but I think they are much more used in order to deal damage to the enemy buildings. Ideally, you want to deal damage to the enemy furnaces in this case. Because with the pillage ability, you can actually steal money constantly from your opponent, 24-7. And if, you don't, if your opponent doesn't demolish those furnaces, it's going to be a you know, win-win situation for you because you will get a lot of experience, power points, and also money from attacking the furnace all the time. He's not paying attention, he's running actually into the range of the fortress. But he will be able to steal some money, he won't be able to kill the furnace I think. Because he's using, oh never mind, he's using the aggressive stance and it looks like Lucas is not paying attention. He might be able to kill it, look, you see that guys, plus one, plus one, plus one all the time. I mean, on the bright side for the Isengard's player Lucas, killing those white men of Dunan is super easy. They are very squishy units, so they're gonna die in a second. They are like glass cannons, that's what I you know, used to call them. Because they are all about dealing damage, not about tanking damage, unlike Urukai for example. Urukai are very very tanky units, you will need a lot of time to kill them, especially if they use the um, hold ground stands and the shield ball formation, that's gonna make them super tanky. With the war chant combined, you can actually stall a lot of time against any units. Even, the, you know, even some war riders, they will need a lot of time to kill you. Uh, and it was even harder to do before the armor fix in the version 8.2. Before that, if you was using soldiers or Urukai with the shield wall, hold ground stands and the buff of either rallying call or war chant, you could become almost unkillable. <laughs> you was just standing there and laughing at the damage, they were trampling you down, but you was like, ha ha ha, are you even trying bro, you know? Now it's much much easier to kill them, even in the shield wall formation. Okay, this furnace here from Lucas is gonna be taken down next. And you can already see, you know, like Lukat is going for the for the work pits, uh, you know, Uruk pits into the work pits, and on the other side, Daryl was going for the clan setting level one after the Uruk, Uruk pits. Now he's building up a work pit at the same time as well. And I don't know, I don't know about that. Like Isengard is a great faction in the mid to late game. Once you reach the milestone of unlocking the uh, unlocking the devastation or you know industry or field of fires, you will be golden. But until this point. You will struggle resource-wise, and that's why it's such a challenge to keep three production buildings up on the field with low command points, especially if you are being attacked. Like, you need to invest a lot of money in order to recruit Uruk Pikemen, Urukai. They are very, very expensive units, as we guys know, right? And with that being said, uh, you want to make sure that you go, like, you build two furnaces before you build anything else, just to be able... Oh, that's a nice attack, actually. That's a really nice attack from Lucas. I mean, from Dyrell. I'm always confused because it's the same faction, guys. The Uruk pit has been taken down. That's huge. That's huge. And yeah, I think he should be good because this army is not going to be able to deal damage to the buildings. This is only archer based army from Lukat. The only unit that can actually deal damage to the enemy buildings is the Spikeman unit. That's all. Yeah, we are getting some more Wildman on the fields now from the clan sitting. Alright. But. It's a great situation for Lukat, Lukat regardless, because he's camping right in front of the production buildings. However, they have no protection now from any pikemen, so that means they're gonna get trampled down and they're gonna die. 
because the pikemen were being used offensively to finish off the uh, finish off the furnace in the backside. Okay, 375 commander points now for Dyrol. He has almost 10 power points collected, which can be invested into something like Devastation. I think that's gonna be also the case. And 475 command points for Lukat. After the Devastation, he was already able to collect 3 power points. So he has more resources because he was already using the Devastation one time. But obviously losing the Urukpit is gonna put you some, you know, put you behind. And you will need some more time to build up the Urukpit again to make more units. And I think that's the time Dyrol has to use for his own advantage. And the Warkpit is only level 1 as well. So the Warg Packs, obviously they can't fight against the Warg Riders. That's not going to be possible. And the Warkpit from uh, Dyrol is level 2. But he lost the level 2 Furnace in the backside, which is really unfortunate. He's low on command points. He has finally Devastation unlocked and he's going to be using it immediately. Look the money he was getting from that. Needs to expand now. He's going for a hero at the same time. I think it's going to be Sharku. Sharku is going to come from uh, from Dyrol and Lurt is coming from Lukat. I think Sharku in this situation... Oh, he has... He has Sharku already, right? No, oh, yeah. He has Sharku and Lurt. Alright, I see him. He was able to get them both on the field. If you make a choice, if you have to make a choice, you know, if you want to get Luke, not Luke, I'm, I'm confused guys, sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> if you want to get Sharko or uh, Lords on the field, I would, in a situation like this, I mean, I would prefer to get Sharko on the field. Why? Because the enemy has now work packs, right? He has archers and Sharko is just so good against those units. On the other side, you are also mobile. You can use Sharko in the worst case scenario for harassment. You can go for attack, keep killing furnaces left and right. I mean, true that Lourdes is gonna be more reliable in the late game because of the leadership, because of the pillage ability, because of the cripple ability. But in the early mid game, Sharko can offer you much more than Lourdes can, in my opinion, especially in this situation right there. Okay, we are also getting Black Orcs on the field from Lukat, from the inn, which is right there. Inns are being protected on this map from the White Slayer. And White Slayer is only existing in this map, in our map pool of the Battles for Christmas tournament. That is only this one map, which includes the White Slayer. They have also Goblin Lair, by the way, on this map. I mean, that's also one of the maps I think we don't have a work Lair at. Like, Warclayer is so standard, guys, right? Warclayer is almost in every single map. But this map doesn't include the Warclayer. It includes Troll Layers, Goblin Layers, and White Layers. The Builder has been taken down from Dyrol, by the way, at the backside of the Fortress. And, yeah, Lukat, I mean, I forgot to mention this one. Lukat is the main, is a main Isengard player. Like, he likes to play Isengard a lot. And I would say that's why he has also more experience with this faction. Remember, uh, in the Battle for Christmas tournament, you are able to pick the faction you want to play with. You don't have to pick random guys. It's a, it's, a, it's a tournament that allows you to pick either random or any faction you want to play with. And I think that's really nice because Rise of the Witch King is including seven factions. and I would love to see some new faces in those events as well. And if, you for, if, you, if I would force them to pick random, uh, it would take them ages to get used to seven different factions. You know, in order to master seven factions at once, you will need to invest multiple years into this game. That's why there are some players, they are one-trick ponies, they like to play one specific faction, you know, maybe Elves, maybe Isengard, maybe Mordor. And why should they not be able to participate in those kind of events? That's why everyone is able to pick either random or a specific faction. Everything is allowed. Okay, so we have, um, yeah, I mean, Dyrol in a situation, in a turtle situation, he needs to be now very passive and has to play defensively. At this point of the game, Dyrol has to rely on the mistakes of Lukat, and if Lukat doesn't make any mistakes or any big game-changing mistakes, this game should be definitely in favor of the Orange Isengard player Lukat. He has such a big advantage, Dyrol is being command points kept, he is low on resources, Go on command points. On the other side, we have 700 command points collected by Lukat. He is also having a big advantage in terms of power points, so you can use that 9 power points into something like Cremain, or save for the 10 into something like Wildman of Dunland. 
His command points kept, so he has way more units on the field than his opponent does. He is creeping at the same time, expanding. That's a perfect example of how to snowball your lead. Like, it's not only about attacking your opponent 24-7, but using the map in your favor and actually expanding, denying your opponent the resource income, keeping up the pressure so he can't expand. This way you can build up your lead to a maximum amount and that's gonna be almost unwinnable at this point for the opponent Isengard's player, Dyrell. And power points collected now. Let's see what he's gonna go for. Devastation is gonna be almost back up for Lukat as well. The army is looking scary to me. Warchanted, Crossbow Man, Black Oryx and Urukai. Warchant is being used now from Lukat defensively, but the army advantage is definitely on the side from Lukat. However, he was not sporting the fight with Sharku for some reason, I don't understand. Lurz is diving in, he's level 4 already. He's actually popping off, guys, look at this, he's killing so much. Rubin is being used also from Lukat. He was also using Devastation now. Rubin is also being used from Dyrell, so debuff against debuff. But the units from Lukat were just too many and powerful and that's why this fight was dominated from the Orange Isengard's play Lukat. The Furnace in the meantime is gonna be taken down next. Charku is being helpful, the level 3 Furnace is almost like a quarter of the command points Dyrell has left. That's gonna drop him down to 300 command points only. His resources are not looking great. On the right side, the Devastation is gonna be helpful in the next 30 seconds. But until this point, he might lose everything what he has left on the field, guys. Here's a level 2 Uruk with this wall. He was able to get some Berserkers. Those are units we also don't get to see very often in these games. They are pretty expensive. They cost 300 each and it's a single unit, guys. It's, a, it's one unit only. I mean, they are nice for harassment. I would love to see them more often, you know, when it comes to send them out forwards one by one and try to sneak some Berserkers into the backline in order to kill some production buildings like Furnaces, Malone Trees or whatsoever, depending on the matchup. But if you don't make them work, they are really expensive. They cost 300 each. However, look at the damage they are dealing to the Furnace. They are dealing actually a significant amount of damage. Now, Dyrell is being able to push back, but during all this time, he is losing the clan setting. Sharku is getting level 5. There is... No, the... What? He's using the Tainted Land from Isengard, which costs, by the way, 10 power points, unlike the Tainted Land from the Goblin Faction or Mordor Faction, but... On the bright side, the Tainted Land from Isengard gives you also pillage. Look at this. So on the on the land, you get money for kills. Um, something like the pillage ability, pretty much. And you get the same amount of stats, you get 50% damage and 50% armor. I mean, Isengard needs to invest 10 power points for that Tainted Land, and Mordor or Goblins, they can invest only 5 power points and still get it unlocked. But with the buff of the Tainted Land, they are able to deal decent amount of damage, now all the production buildings, all the production buildings are gone. He is forced to build another Uruk pits now, um, and this game is gonna be very, very hard for uh, Dyrell to win. You know, but I was thinking the same way. Oh, never mind. He's gonna leave the game. <laughs> all right, it was the shortest game in the best of three um, between Dyrell and Lukat. It was a nice game. Um, both mirrors, Mordor mirror was won by Dyrell, Isengard's mirror was won by Lukat, and the most impressive game was definitely the game number two. It was Isengard against Man of the West. Pretty nice defense from Lukat, defending until the end, and then actually being able to win these games pretty nicely. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to, like, uh, to leave a like on this video and subscribe for more content like this. I'm also streaming on Twitch, Twitch TV slash BeyondStandards. The link for that is going to be in the video description down below. I see you guys next time. Until then, take care of yourself. Have a fantastic Christmas. And as always, stay beyond standards. Peace, boys.